John chapter 11 today. So if you have your Bibles with you or your devices with you today, I will be projecting my translation of the book of John up on the screen today. There's not a lot of uh, twists and turns. Well, there is one. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a translation about how Jesus responded when he saw death that is very weak in most of our traditional translations. And uh, I've strengthened it quite a bit. So we'll, we'll talk about it when we get there. Last week, we talked about walking in life, and that's clearly what was going on. When it, John chapter 11 is the, like, the whole book of John has been building to John chapter 11. It, it's like right to the place where Jesus, when he looks at Martha and says, do you believe this, is ringing down through the millennia to us asking the same question, do you believe this? And the answer, by and large, among Christians is no. Because we don't live as if we do. But there's always been a Christian remnant that we um, recognize that has held firmly to the promises of the Word of God, even in the area of life. And so I'm going to get into this before we discuss specifically Mary's answer. Um, today we're going to talk about what happens when you believe the impossible. Now, next week we're going to talk about when you don't believe the impossible, and it's really bad, okay? But this week we're talking about the really good, <laughs> believing the impossible, and uh, what happens when you believe it. John eleven twenty seven to 44, we're going to start a little bit earlier than verse 27, just to put ourselves back into the context. This is when Jesus was speaking to Martha, and Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live, even though he has died, and everyone who is living and believes in me will never die forever. That's kind of awkward, but I'm making a point. That's what he is doing, very awkwardly emphasizing the nature. Never forever. So, do you believe this? And that's where we left last week after, after uh, he, that question just hang out there. Do you believe this? And the issue isn't the resurrection from the dead. We all believe that, mostly. I mean, you understand there's a lot of Christian churches that don't believe in the resurrection from the dead anymore. They're not really Christian churches, but they call themselves that. There are churches that right now in their seminaries teach that there's no such thing as the supernatural. There's no such thing as God. Oh, guys, this has been happening for 40 years, 50 years. Okay. You're just way behind the program. Okay. The, uh, the, the, this, this, I could give you names of, you know, when they, they were uh, interviewing, oh, geez, his name just slipped my mind. But he was, uh, he was a well-known theologian and doctor, and he would speak for the body of Christ and Finally, someone was, you know, they're trying to nail him down because he's just really slippery and uncomfortable. Well-respected, but this was back in the 60s. Slippery, on maybe the 50s, slippery and uncomfortable. They couldn't figure out exactly if he really believed what he was saying. And finally, when he was being interviewed once, a newspaper man said, hey, I have a, he finally figured out, a guy that, that not a newspaper man, but a guy, a theologian who figured out how to ask the question. He said, okay, sir. If newspapers had been published on the day after the resurrection, would it have made the paper? And that was the first time they realized he didn't even believe because he said no. He felt it was myth. That's the way it is. I am telling you, the purpose of, in many churches today, the purpose of being in church is to become self-actualized before you die and your existence ends. Aren't you glad you're here by instead? Okay. I've got the theological books from the other 
denominations that teach that sort of stuff. Now, thank God there's a lot of really good Christian churches that firmly believe the same thing that we do about the resurrection of the dead and Jesus and, and uh, heaven and eternal life and all that stuff. I mean, there's a lot of Christians that believe exactly what we do. But you understand, when we talk about mainline denominations, you just got to be aware of the fact that, you know, if you walk into certain churches, um, you're going to find things that aren't quite what you expect. Uh, there's been a lot of splits in the mainline churches recently because of that same thing, um, where some are simply saying we draw the line. You are going too far away from the scriptures. And so mainline denominations have been, uh, number one, losing people left and right, because why would you go to church to a church that doesn't believe in the power of God or anything else? Anyway, so when Jesus said to Martha, do you believe this? It wasn't about the resurrection because the majority of real Christians have a firm belief in the resurrection. It's the second thing he said. He said, I'm not only the resurrection, I'm the life. And it's a compound sentence. It's, I'm the resurrection. Anyone who believes in me will live even though he has died. And I'm the life. Everyone who is living and believes in me will never die forever. Now, last week I, I shared a quote with you from uh, the Pillar Commentary. It's a, one of the new toys that I purchased as I was starting the book of John again because you, you want to make sure you have some new, fresh input. And... Uh, he says, it's clear, and he, he, he breaks out the verse the same way I do. There's two parts to it. I am the resurrection. I am the life. Uh, he, lives, or he who believes in me will live even though he dies. That goes with the resurrection. And the second part is uh, anyone who is living and believes in me will never die forever, never die. Never, ever die. You could say it that way, too. And uh, so he says, it's clear that Jesus is saying that in some way... Remember this from last week? Believers will never die. So it's that in some way waffle, equivocation. Because Jesus doesn't say believers will never die in some way. You know what he says? They will never die. So if that isn't our experience, it's not because Jesus was wrong. It's because we somehow have not got to the part of living and believing. Living is talking about living in eternal life. Clearly, he who lives in believing, uh, um, we have eternal life. We've crossed over from death to life. We have stepped into the area of eternal life. The Apostle Paul says to Timothy, take firm hold of the eternal life to which we've been called. So we as believers have crossed over from death to life. We are already experiencing eternal life. And so Jesus is talking about believers who have already stepped into eternal life. And now to take firm hold of it is to apply as much of it to yourself now as you possibly can. That's why we pray for healing. That's why we get encouragements from God prophetically. We are taking the aspects of eternal life that are going to be present for all of eternity and we're grabbing onto them now in much the same way that, Je or that excuse me, David in the Old Testament looked ahead to the New Covenant and he was offering sacrifices even though he wasn't a priest. Now think about that. Saul did that and he lost the kingdom. David said that did that and it was cheesy fine. Everything was pitchy keen. Why? Because David did it through faith. He had looked into the new covenant and he began living in the new covenant. He took the new covenant before he, the new covenant was there and he applied it to himself. And because he did that in faith and applied it to himself, he was able to do things that got Saul removed from his kingship. And in the same way, we're looking ahead to the eternal covenant. And we apply it to our lives now through faith. So we have the ability to apply eternal life to our lives, aspects of it. Otherwise, forget about praying for healing. By the way, there are Christians that believe you should pr forget about praying for healing. You do know that, right? Okay, I just, why would you bother? Okay, there are sometimes people that say, no, you don't have to pray for me. It's okay because, you know, if I die, I'll go to be with Jesus. And Jesus is going to look at you and say, that's really not what I intended. I intended you to live in faith. Jesus, in fact, said when the Son of Man comes again, will he find faith on the earth? That is not, oh, he's not, he's, he's not saying, boy, I sure hope these believers don't believe in everything that I've given my life for for them. What he's saying is, 
things are going to get so bad at the end that the believers are not even going to have faith anymore for the things that could have been theirs. Now, by the way, it is a given. I can tell you this. You're going to stand before the Lord, and one of the first things you're going to see is all of the things that could have been a reality in your life if you'd have had more faith. That's a given. Because we're, we, <laughs> we're human beings, and we're learning, and we're living in it. But I would like what I have apprehended to eclipse in some way what I have not apprehended. So it's a reality. I think when it says that Jesus will wipe away every tear from our eye, there's a whole big list of things that he'll have to go down the list. And that's probably one of them when you realize, oh, I could have walked in that. I never did. I didn't have faith for it, even though it's clearly in Scripture or it's clearly part of what he spoke to me or whatever. Just get used to the idea that you're going to have, you're never going to attain to the fullness of everything that you could have attained to in this life. However, keep trying. You know, if you don't attain to everything that God has given you the ability to go after, and, and Paul didn't see himself doing that, you understand? The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest Christians of all time, uh, he knew that he fell short. Um, but our goal is to be able to give glory to God with everything that we can. So... Do you believe this? That's a question for all of us all of the time. Do we believe that God has more for us than we're walking in? If we don't, well, then we're fine. We can sit around, twiddle our thumbs, and not strive for it. But if we do believe that God has more for us in this arena than we currently are walking in, we can just pray and believe more every day. And the problem is, I mean, obviously, it's convincing yourself up here. You know, it's, it's to be able to live. And last week I talked about what we do is we win this battle generationally. Because stuff that we struggle with, the next generation that is in this congregation and congregations like ours will not even find a problem with. And then they'll be able to step further into it and further into it. And then we will see the glory of God be released on the earth. That's the plan. Okay. So Jesus asked Martha, do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. And so her, she gives a resounding yes that she believes it. Now later on, she would say, Lord, don't take the stone away from the tomb because his body has an odor by now. Which means she wasn't saying, I, she wasn't even saying, I believe you're going to raise Lazarus from the dead right now. But remember, she was believing who he was. And she recognized who he was. Um, it's an emphatic affirmative. I believe that you're the Christ. That means the Messiah, the one who had been promised from God by, from, from the Garden of Eden. And had been, history had been you know, shaped by God in heaven so that Jesus would be born of a virgin in Bethlehem when the time had fully come. And then she said, I believe that you are the Son of God, the coming one. Son of God, Messiah, almost synonymous at that time. And uh, the coming one, though, it's very interesting because there's a bunch of scriptures. That's how they would talk about the coming one or the one who is coming. Blessed is the one who comes. Remember when John the Baptist, in uh, Matthew 11 it is, he said, are you the one to come? Or should we look for another? And then Jesus had that whole conversation with his disciples. It's the coming one thing. And so blessed is the one who comes in the name of Yahweh. We have blessed you from the house of Yahweh. That's Psalm 118. Psalm 40, which is awful, awesome. Uh, awesome. Aw, uh, also, that's a good word, also. Keep that in mind. Which is also a messianic psalm. Um, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire. You have opened my ears. You have not asked for a burnt offering or a sin offering. Then I said, look, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll of the book. And then Malachi, you know, the last book that in our order. Look, I am sending my messenger and he will clear the way before me. Suddenly the Lord whom you are seeking will come to his temple. And Jesus was the one who was coming. He came to his temple. So Mary was saying very clearly, I believe you're the Messiah, and I believe that you were the Messiah that was promised, who was to come. So, after she said this, she went and called her sister Mary secretly and said, the teacher is here and is asking for you. 
When she heard it, she quickly got up and went to meet him. Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. So when the Jewish leaders who were with her in the house comforting her saw Mary get up quickly and leave, they followed her, believing that she was going to the tomb so she could weep there. That was the Lord setting things up. You know, the, the Father was setting things up for what was about to happen. So, um, we don't hear the conversation between uh, Martha and Jesus, but obviously Martha runs back and says, he's asking for you. And so we don't get that part. That is not recorded here. Reminds us that we don't have all the dialogue. We just have enough dialogue to be able to understand the things that were exchanged. And so Martha goes back privately to avoid complications. And you say, what complications could there possibly be? Well, let's see. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, had tried to stone him twice already. And they were looking for ways to ruin him or destroy him, if not kill him. There had been certain pockets among the Pharisees that wanted to kill him. And so eh, things could be tense. Can you? It's just a little embarrassing if Jesus comes waltzing into the house with the people who uh, a week earlier were gathering stones to stone him to death. It would be a very difficult scene. And so Jesus stays where he is. Martha goes and pulls Mary aside and says, hey, he's looking for you. And so she quickly rushes out. Now, here's where we got the human paradox. This is people who have plotted in their heart, some of them, to kill the guy who claims to be Messiah. They have gathered stones to do the same. but they were still comforting a woman, two women, who needed comfort. And when they saw that Mary left for the out, outside, they figured, oh, she's going to the tomb, and if she's going there, she's going to need our support. I mean, I, that's, that's, us, that's us as humans, right? We can be... <laughs> we're not the bad guys in our own story, Understand, there's really not too many human beings who have ever said, I'm the villain. They have a reason for the things that they are doing that now history looks at and says this was awful. And they may not have been all bad. These were not all bad people. You, you, you know, they, they did things in legalism that loaded up people and, and, and didn't help get people free from all of the religious garbage and the legalisms. Um, but when it came down to it, they were there at a funeral when it counted. And they were concerned about giving comfort to a woman who had lost her brother. And that's, that's the human paradox. That's just so. They follow, which means they were going to run into Jesus. When Mary arrived where he was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jewish leaders who had come with her weeping, he became angry in his spirit and shook himself. And you can imagine it was like this, just a shake that happened. Okay, now this is... This is um, as we see this scene unfolding, um, Jesus, Mary falls at his feet. She's, she's at his feet. And she says the same words that Martha said. It's interesting, when Martha said the words, Jesus gets into a dialogue with her. When Jesus sees her and hears the words from her, it moves him. And that's, it's an interesting, it's just interesting. I don't know if there's any deductions that you can draw from it. It's just that by the time that Mary got there, Jesus was emotionally moved. She fell at his feet. She uh, it is not making an accusation. She's making a statement of faith in the same way that Martha did. Uh, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, Lord. You have the ability to conquer this. And so, we, you know, it's just the way it was. They knew he could not be there. He was too far away. And we talked about that last week. So she made a statement of faith. 
it says when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jewish leaders weeping, and the Greek word really means wailing. We're not talking in that culture, you didn't like weep quietly. Remember the Pharisee standing in the temple who was praying and he says, Lord, thank you that you haven't made me like these really nasty people around me, including that tax collector over there. They prayed out loud. You know, they weren't, they weren't, they didn't bottle it up. And so when they were weeping, they didn't bottle it up. And they also had professional mourners. Even the poorest people had instructions from rabbinic leaders that they had to have at least a couple of professional mourners, you know, music players, flute players, around for any funeral. You know, they you could get one of those pretty cheap, so you they had instructions. Mary and Martha were pretty wealthy. You could imagine that they had the best of the best. Their professional mourners were loud and eloquent. So, the... Uh, but when Jesus saw all the commotion, he responded to it. And uh, it says that he became angry in his spirit and shook himself. Now, that's literally what the Greek words mean. If you look at what the NIV says, um, or the, uh, and I even forget what the NIV says, but it's a real mild term. Some, one translation says he sighed inside himself. No, no, that's not what he did. Um, I, as I was looking at this, um, I was doing the study of translations that have taken this Greek word. You could translate this, he snorted with indignation. Okay, that's how strong it is. Like he physically responded in indignation to death. And the English translations, by and large, have really softened it for some reason, probably because of a religious spirit. I'm, not, I'm serious. He says Jesus wouldn't have acted like this. Uh, this is the Jesus who bound cords into a whip and overturned money changers' tables at the temple. Best get a different idea of who Jesus is. Because this Jesus was a man of action. I'm not saying he was violent, because he certainly was, and he was meek. And he, would, he, he, he met his um, people that were against him with words and warnings, uh, but, and sometimes with miracles that got him escaped safely. But he certainly was not a meek and mild person in his personality and um, not that religious thing which we see so much of. And so the, uh, his, his response reflected who he was and what he thought about death. Now, by the way, way back in the German language, when they translated, when Martin Luther translated, way back, the first translations of the Bible that came out after the, you know, it started, by the way, Bible was in Greek and in Hebrew, Old Testament. And then at the time of the disciples, there were versions in Syri, it's called the Syriac versions, it was Syrian, Aramaic. They made versions of the original, and then they would... Uh, put them around the world. It's the way it was. They had to. Same thing. Same reason we would, because people couldn't read Greek as well as they could read their own language. And so there's all sorts of different translations from that time period. And then what happened is the Roman Catholic Church took ascendancy, and Jerome made his translation of the Vulgate, and that became the standard. And for years and years and years and years, there were no other Bibles. It was the Vulgate, and only the priests knew how to read the Vulgate, and every priest got it, understood how to read the Latin of the Vulgate. And then what happened is Martin Luther came along and he trans He wasn't the only one. There were several others. Um, but they all started translating the Bible into their original languages. And Luther, in his version, has extremely strong language about what Jesus did because he recognized the import of the Greek word. But for whatever reason, the English versions toned it way down. This is what Jesus did. He became angry you could say inside, but in his spirit is better. He was stirred up in his spirit, and the Holy Spirit was fully there. And he shook with outrage at the fact that death did this to people and made them weep and mourn. He was indignant at death. By the way, Jesus is still indignant at death. I want you to think about this because sometimes we say at a funeral, this was the best thing. 
Jesus was indignant at death. When we say that, we're speaking from our humanness. But death is an enemy. From our humanness, we may say, well, thank God, because death has been manifesting in a person's life for a long time. And what I mean by that is every sickness is death manifesting. Every negative things in our body is death manifesting. And so what, by the time a person finally shuffles off this mortal coil, their existence could have been so bad that it's a relief to the relatives that the person is no longer suffering. But even in the face of that, when we can thank God that their suffering is over, and by the way, that's a worthy prayer. We still have to remember death is an enemy, and it didn't start at the point that the person shuffled off. It started when they started to get sick. And that enemy manifested itself until their body could no longer function anymore. Realize how Jesus responded to death. He was indignant about it. He was emotionally distressed. And by the way, he knew what he was going to do. He was indignant at death and he knew he was going to raise him again. Well, guess what? He knows he's going to raise every Christian that dies. So, he asked, where have you buried him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus broke out in tears. That's an amazing thing. That's, that's now on the outside manifesting, which was on the inside. So they, he said, what are we, where is he buried? We need to go to the tomb. Because he knew what he was going to do at the tomb. They're just thinking, oh, he's going to come and see the tomb and pay his respects in the same way that we will visit tombstones after a funeral or years after. We'll come and pay our respects to the deceased at a tombstone. And uh, he, he uh, that's what they're thinking. That he has something far more in mind. And so they said, hey, come along. We'll show you. And so the whole entourage starts going in that direction. And then it says Jesus broke out into tears. I know we often say in the, N the NIV's translation is the shortest verse uh, in the Bible. Jesus wept. I think it's Paul's verse, pray continually. Um, and I made sure when I translated it that Paul's verse was the shortest verse in the Bible. Um, Jesus broke out in tears is a much better way than saying he wept because the word weep can mean that wailing, mourning thing in that culture. Jesus just started to shed tears. That's another way that you could say he began to shed tears. And uh, it means he was emotionally moved. That indignation he felt and the pain that he felt from everyone moved him to have tears. I think, you know, you understand, Dawn was talking about the passing of her father today, and she did really good. But you could hear the quaver. You know, if you, if you were listening, you know that. Why? Because when you're talking about the death of a parent, you're this close to shedding tears, always. It's just the way it is because of, of who we are. So, so the Jewish religious leaders began to say, look how he loved him. But some from among them responded, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have also done something so that this man would not have died? You can just see these people. Well, if he really loved him, what bozos. So Jesus was again angry within himself as he arrived at the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was covering the entrance. And so now we have this scenario. Mixed reaction from the religious leaders. Some of them are saying, you know, you know, he loved him a lot. And the others were saying, humph. You know, it's like, jeez. Um. Jesus is still indignant over death. He was angry within himself again. And as he arrived, they got to the cave. And it's, you know, it's a cave with a stone in front of it. That's echoes of the garden tomb, right? Um, the wealthy were often buried in uh, rocks that had been hollowed out. There's softer rocks in the hillsides. They could dig in. You know, they'd get a, someone to carve it out. And they would make a couple of shelves on the side and then shelving in back. And the way that the graves worked was simply this. When someone died, remember, they needed to get them in the ground real quickly because of the climate. And 
So they would, and they did not embalm. They just put the spices with the body so that the body, you know, the spices would help overcome some of the, you know, obvious odors. So they'd take the body in and they'd put it on a shelf. And the reason they had two shelves is because sometimes people died fairly close to one another. The shelf was the place where the body would desiccate. And when the body had fully been consumed and there were only bones left, they would come in and they'd bring in an ossuary. And that ossuary was just a box that was big enough to be able to hold, a stone box that was big enough to be able to hold the bones. And so then they'd put the bones in the box. They'd usually put the person's name on the box, and they'd go back and they'd put it on the shelves. We have somewhat similar today. We have, we have those, uh, you know, what do you call them? Uh, the, up, the above ground places that caskets are buried. But we also now have places where after, a, uh, um, after someone is uh, cremated, thank you, it's almost as bad as the word also. Anyway, when someone is cremated, that they are able to be, you know, there's a shelf, basically, size to put them on. Um, so anyway, that's what they did. And so, so Lazarus is in the cave. And he's been there four days, and the stone is in the way. So Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the one who had died, said to him, Lord, there's already a bad smell, for it's been four days. But Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So, Martha's ever practical. Jesus says, Take away the stone. And this is the face of literally everyone there. <laughs> no! This is, this is not good. What are you thinking? Okay, that's protecting us. Okay, and, and uh, so Martha has to spell it out for him. You know, we have a practical problem here, Lord. This is going to be bad. And uh, Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Now, by the way, in this discussion with the sisters, he doesn't say that. However, if you go all the way back to verse 4, when he was responding to their message, he, when Jesus heard the message, he replied. He replied to their message. He sent the messenger back. This sickness isn't so that, the, that Lazarus dies, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God might be glorified through it. And so Jesus said, didn't I tell you if you believed you would see the glory of God? That was the first message he sent back to them that bounced off of their heads because they didn't get it. I mean, they got the message. They just didn't get what he meant by it. So he says, did I not say you'd see the glory of God? Because that's what we're about to see. So there's this conditional statement. If you believed, you will see. Hmm. You know, it's kind of like the one who's living and believing. That was That's conditional, right? You got to. You got to be one who has eternal life, and you got to believe. And here he said, "If if you believed." And what did Jesus got Martha to say? Yes, Lord. When she said, "I believe." Do you believe this? Yes. She had already said that. I believe. Yes, Lord. She told him, "I believe." And so now he's saying. I told you, if you believed, you'd see the glory of God. And that's exactly what was going to happen. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes upward and said, Father, I give thanks to you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but on account of the crowd standing around, I am saying this in order that they might believe that you sent me. So he got him to move the stone. By the way, that only would have happened if one of the sisters said move the stone. So they were... They were stepping into it. And uh, he, gave, he gives a prayer of thanks. Verbally, he says, I give thanks to you that you have heard me, which means he's already been discussing this with the Father. And now he's just saying it out loud so that everyone around him would believe, so that they would hear the conversation that he was having the Father, with the Father in heaven. And after he said these things, he called out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The one who had died came out with his feet and hands still bound with strips of cloth and his face still wrapped with a burial cloth. Jesus said to them, untie him and let him go. Ah, oh, this had to be a scene. 
I can't even imagine. The sisters are going, oh, he wants the stone moved away. Okay. Then they said, I told you if you believe. And so he gives this loud command. He doesn't, and you can imagine, he didn't let much time pass. The stone got moved and he calls out because he didn't want any suspense. And he gives this loud command and um, all of a sudden we see Lazarus, four days, Lazarus comes out. Interesting, it says that he was all wrapped up. <laughs> he, was, he was covered in the shrouds of death. Um, there's a, you know, when you realize how they wrap people up back then, he was probably like going like this. Because there would have been tight wraps around his legs. And even the, the you know, when he stood up, the, the covering over his face would have shifted a little bit so he could see. And if he couldn't see, at least he knows the tomb. He had it built for him or, you know, he, his family. And so he was able to see the light of, you know, when the stone was moved. He, and so he was able to get out. And so Jesus said, untie him and let him go. Now, I can imagine that all of those grave clothes, when Jesus looks at us and death coming against us, that's what he sees still kind of binding us in a variety of different ways. And the reason that John chapter 11 is in the Bible is so that we get rid of as much of these grave clothes as we can. Okay, Where are they? If they're on our face, it means we can't even see the promise. And my job has been to try to get this off of your eyes so you can see the promise, you can see the possibilities. That doesn't mean you can step into it fully yet because we still have to get over what's up here. But the more we step into it, the more we can let what we know begin to Im impact our, our, our reality, our bodies. And we can begin to believe for things that we thought were impossible. And that's part of the process that we're in right now when he said release him and let him go get those things off of him grab on to that today grab on he wants to get the grave clothes off of us he doesn't want us to have a death mindset he wants us to have a life mindset we live in a death mindset that's because we live in a world filled with pain and sickness and problems and we need to get our minds into that kingdom mindset where death is defeated because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, conquered it. He took the keys of death and hell. That means the authority has been given to him, and he has given it to us. And the way that we are able to exercise those keys is through faith. But faith requires that we believe it. Otherwise, it's hard to exercise it. You know, if we got every year, if we got up in front of the hurricane season and came in here and said, well, that would be really nice if there were no hurricanes this year. But I'm going to look at the meteorologists, what they're saying, because they know what they're talking about. That's not faith. Okay? I, you know, it, it's akin to us and I don't want to be, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to say more than I should because I don't want you to misunderstand me. But there are times when we get up or we're whatever, we've had a bad night or whatever, and we say, boy, I really believe that God wants to bless me, but I feel like garbage. I better go over by the doctor and see what he has to say. I'm not telling you not to go to the doctor. I think, in fact, there's, sometimes there's really easy things that can be taken care of. Sometimes it's just going to give you peace of mind. But in the same way that we don't trust the meteorologist with the fullness of the forecast, but we pray and we break the power of those storms and we do all that, when a doctor gives you what he believes is going on in your life and body, you pray the same way you pray against storms doesn't matter what the diagnosis is doesn't matter what the hurricane track is the lord has in fact told us many many times that if we are all already have uh, authority over physical storms 
we have authority over the other types of storms that show up in our lives. No matter what the track is, no matter what the forecast is, it applies in the same way. We just need to believe so that we can see the glory of God. Well, I'm up for that. So today, what happens when you believe the impossible? We've seen it. Death is defeated. What happens when you don't believe the impossible? That's next week, Sunday. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to be in your word, seeing this incredible chapter that you wrote, had John write in the, in the book of John, that would demonstrate life in so many different ways and demonstrate the contrast between those who walk in life and those who don't. Lord, I ask that we would always be among those who believe the impossible so that we together might be among those who conquer death. In your name, Jesus. Amen.